Good afternoon, everyone. Can I please ask for your attention? Well, first of all, thank you for having made this uh, Monday afternoon. Um, you will not regret. This is a very important thing that we're going to discuss. We will be here with you for the three days, but all the time that you will be spending here will be worthwhile, we promise. And that is because the topic that we are going to discuss is, is um, not necessarily new, but the things which we will be discovering with you. And uh, that will pave the way, hopefully, for the future, will really be new. So it will take some creative mind, it will take some courage, it will take some imagination, also leaning back on the practice that we have had uh, with you today. And hopefully, we will have some interesting ideas right after this. Now, the topic of today's uh, event is European Union Environmental Footprint. We call it Final Conference because we would like to close a certain chapter in, um, in the big work that we have done up to now. It has been nearly five years since we have been testing an idea, an idea that came uh, back in 2013, probably way before, is to ask the question, how do we make sure that the information that is put on a product, or put on a label, or put on the name of a company, about a green claim, about environmental claim, whether it's sustainable, circular, um, organic, fair, or anything you want, is true. How do we make sure that there is no cheating going on there? How do we make sure that the free riders got, don't get the easy way, and those that really invest in it, they're really paid back? Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, as you can imagine, because there are millions of products out there, and there are millions of companies out there. How do you measure everyone? And should we measure everyone? Is there a methodology? Is there a smart way to do it? This is what the pilot um, of the environment footprint has been about. Uh, we have reached a certain uh, stage where we can draw some conclusions, and as I said in the very beginning, to, uh, to pave the way. Um, it has a political connotation because it was European Commission that has uh, begun this pilot, but it has done with hundreds of uh, stakeholders and thousands of the followers. And it's, again, for a political master's, for the political commission to take decisions further. But it will not be done ever without people like yourselves or without a wider consultation. Now, what um, we have really enjoyed is a patience and understanding of our political masters uh, for allowing to go into this pilot, which has lasted several years, and normally we know that. In politics, um, time is really short, you need to deliver really fast, so something of this kind is not always known in politics, and that's why we really appreciate from the politicians that patience and that support that we have got from them. And one of those uh, politicians is um, a European Commissioner uh, for Environment and Fisheries, who is here with us. He will share with us um, his own view about the environmental footprint, possibly about uh, what can be done, what cannot be done, and where he would also see us going with that. So without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Carmen Vela, who is our Commissioner for Environment and Fisheries, to say an opening word. Yeah. Commissioner. Thank you very much, uh, Sadoskas. A very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues, and thank you for your interest in this uh, topic. I used to think that it was always the other way around, that experts and technical people have to have patience with us politicians, so thank you. At least the feeling is reciprocal. <laughs> So this footprint has been, as Kastutis has said, quite an adventure. And although it's certainly not coming to a close, we have reached a turning point. It is time for the big decisions. Whenever I, I think of the footprint, I am taken back to, to my childhood. I grew up by the sea. I grew up in a small fishing village in Malta. And every, each and every day, I saw the same Miracle! I would go home in the evening from a beach where the traces of the day were very plain to see, and I would return the very next morning to find the beach 
wiped clean, all footprints erased, and the same miracle each and every day. The beach is still clean, by the way, and if you are in the area, I recommend it. But as we all know, life isn't that simple. Our footprint on this planet cannot always be magically erased. It's our reality, it's our responsibility, and our society needs to take ownership of its consequences. I think people are ready to do that. In our surveys, nine out of 10 citizens say that protecting the environment is either important or very important to them personally. These people are willing to make real choices, real choices that reflect their values. They will be willing to move, as you see there, from vision to action. And it's our job to help them do that. We need to find ways of making this happen. That's what this conference is for, and it needs a very tangible outcome. Today, we are here to place one of the milestones on that path, the environmental footprint. A lot of hard work has already gone into it, and I would like to publicly thank all the experts who have been involved, especially in the sectors who have stayed the course, right from the beginning, and those who are approaching completion. Stakeholders, volunteers, and data analysts have put in a huge amount of work to get us here. And we have learned a massive amount from you all, even from the projects that fell by the wayside. And I am very pleased to see an end result that translates complexity into very clear messages. It's rather like a, a wristwatch. We know there is a complex mechanism that makes it tick, but we don't need to know how it works to tell the time. That kind of simplicity is very, very important. When you make a decision, you need unambiguous information. This came out very clearly in the work of the High Level Group on Sustainable Finance and in the recent Commission Action Plan for Sustainable Finance. Investors who want to green their portfolio want straightforward answers about who and what is green. Companies that want to green their supply chains need simple criteria to select suppliers or to work with them on improving their environmental performance. Manufacturers who want to make greener products need an easy way to understand the consequences of different design choices. And consumers also need a clear way to identify products that are environmentally friendly, an area where lawmakers have an obvious role to play. The footprint has proved its potential to provide the input for all of those decisions. It's been a four-year journey and we have worked very closely with more than 260 companies and stakeholders who have volunteered their time, their expertise, and also their resources. They were not doing it out of the good of their hearts. They were doing because they believed in the product and they saw the advantages of a common tool at the European level for measuring environmental performance. And the results of this pilot phase are a very promising beginning. They open new pathways for the use of environmental information for the future. We now have the proof that these environmental footprint methods deliver better information than their competitors. These results can be reproduced, compared, and verified more efficiently and more effectively than by any other method. That's a huge success by any standard. We have proved a number of different things. First of all, we have shown that it is quite possible to compare similar products and to take into account all of their impacts from the extraction of raw materials to their end of life. So you can walk into a shop and choose a tin of paint or a bottle of beer on that basis in the knowledge that the producer is committed to transparency and to improving its environmental footprint. It is quite possible to simplify the rules we use to measure environmental life cycle 
performance. We can make life cycle assessments available to companies of any size. When you make the data and the tools available for free, you can bring down the cost of applying the methods by some 80 to 90 percent. And you can verify the information without incurring any excessive costs. It's perfectly possible to involve a high number and a wide variety of stakeholders. More than 2,000 stakeholders were following the pilot phase. And when we were testing how to communicate environmental footprint results, many more businesses and consumers showed a considerable degree of interest. It depends on us to turn this interest into widespread use. I started by saying that we are at a turning point. We are gathering these findings together. We are weighing the implications and together we are looking towards the future. That future starts now and it starts here at this conference. Over the next few days, you will be discussing these achievements and you will be examining the challenges. And I want the debates to resolutely focus on the future. The task now is to take these findings forward and to find ways of actually applying them. Green growth is priority for this commission. It's all about keeping environmental values at the core of business methods. It's about greening supply chains. It's about ensuring that products are designed for circularity. It's Europe's future. We hear this from investors because they know that companies with a corporate responsibility strategy perform better and we are more resilient during downturns. Investments in green funds have grown by more than 40% in recent years. We see it from consumers and market trends. Products that bear sustainability information grow their markets more quickly, 7% in 2015, compared to an average of 1% for other products. The footprint can help with all of those elements. It makes clear the value of simplification without being simplistic of useful information and of informing consumers, businesses, and stakeholders. It shows us the importance of resource use and the value of sharing that information. In the economy of tomorrow, high quality information will be at a premium and the footprint takes us significantly further down that path. Inside the Commission, we will put these findings to very good use. We are here in listening mode, but the work continues in my services. The potential is there in numerous areas, from green public procurement and the EU ecolabel to the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive and the Action Plan on Sustainable Finance. And I am certain we can help them perform much more effectively. At the end of the pilot phase, we may not have all the right answers, but now we do know how to ask the right questions. And that, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, is what we want you to do over the next few days. Inspire us, challenge us, and stay with us on this path. Put your ideas and put your questions on the table, contribute to the debates, and share your insights and share your thoughts. Help us disseminate these methods and help us, above all, to build a better future, the one that our citizens demand and the one that our citizens deserve. Green growth is our future, and the footprint can help us distinguish the green shoots from the green washing. Let's make certain that we do capitalize on that potential. Thank you very much, and I really wish you a good, successful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the Commissioner, uh, for your introduction. and. Um, uh, I think the words that you have said, uh, we need to be simple but not simplistic, and that there is a future into this. We'll have to prove 
um, uh, during our event that indeed there are these solutions. Now, I know that Commission is very busy. Uh, commission is also what Commission has said is like a wristwatch. Um, it's only a few things that you may see on, um, uh, up in the surface, but it's a very intensively working mechanism. And uh, therefore, we have to, if needed, let Commissioner go, do all that internal things that we don't always see, but the results of which sometimes we, uh, we get in joy. So thank you very much um, for, your, for your presence here. Now, I would like to... <clears throat> I would like to uh, do a couple of household announcements. Um, well, first of all, you've noticed and you've seen already that um, the language um, uh, in which we will be conducting uh, the, our event uh, is English. That's the official part. Of course, nothing prevents you from talking all the possible languages uh, informally among yourselves. Um, please, uh, please feel free um, uh, to use our linguistic diversity for that, but uh, here we'll try to stick to one language. Um, uh, then, um, uh, the pilot phase has been an extremely intensive one, where people barely had the rest. So we felt that, okay, let's be uh, somewhat cruel to ourselves in that sense, and let's also do likewise here in the conference. That means that at least today, we'll try to run this for three hours with no coffee break, but if, again, you need to leave, and if you need to have a sip of water or even coffee, it's uh, out there for you, available, but we'd like to use every single minute of this event as um, efficiently as possible. So we'll try to do it until the very end, and the reward for this, uh, it will be a cocktail, which I hope all of you will be able to, um, uh, to enjoy and attend. Uh, the third announcement is, um, is that we will be uh, living in parallel universes at the same time as we uh, all live today. It's not one single thing that we do at the same time, but we try to multitask and we live parallel lives, sometimes interconnected, sometimes not, and this is what we're going to do. Now, that means that we are going to have a conversation here, exchange here, very interesting presentations. But this event is also web stream. That means that there are people out there who are not with us, but who are following us, and um, hopefully we'll be able to tune in, to tune in into, into this event as well. And the way to do it, and that's a very important one, I hope that, um, well, usually in the events, um, um, people are asked to switch off their phones and switch off their iPads and pads and tablets and computers, all electronic devices, will do exactly the opposite. We'd like to get you and keep you connected. So in case you have a device, in case you have something like that, or anything that's bigger, or anything that's nicer, please keep it on. Why am I saying this? Is because we will be able to play some games, ask some questions, and things that may not be said here, will be able to be written elsewhere on the, on the, on the application, which maybe some of you have already heard of, but that's very important for you to know. Now, there is this application which is called Slido. Um, it is a web-based application which allows us to run parallel questions, have polls, uh, check your opinions, make sure you're well connected. Uh, the way to connect to it, as you can see, here on the screen is uh, slido.com. So I'll give you those that would like to be in that universe, connect to this. And uh, the way to enter into the application is to use the, uh, uh, the code word, which is end footprint 18. Well, usually we are very fast with all those things, so I trust that while I'm speaking, you are doing this. And in order to see how it operates, let's, um, let's do it um, right away. If you are connected to this already, let's, for instance, see how, how, it, how it works. One of them to do it is to ask the question, and the first question would be, why are you here? Now, the way to play this game is to, uh, to be able to uh, push your answers in multiple choices. One of them would appear, and then we'll be able to see on the screen your polls, your opinions. We'll be asking throughout the event um, various questions, and uh, like that, we will be able to hopefully sense your, your thinking better than as if we had to simply ask everyone. Now, 
What we have here is you already doing this, voting, and the questions that have been posed to you are what, uh, that you want to know what European environmental footprint is used for. That's one of the possible answers why you're here. The other one is you want to understand the results of this pilot phase or interested in talking to the people. Now, as we can see, I think the majority of you is you want to know what European environmental footprint will be used for. And I can only concur to it because I'd like to know that answer as well. And hopefully on Wednesday we will know it. Yet, of course, for good reason, some of you want to understand the results of the pilot phase. By the way, of course, these questions are not mutually exclusive. Some of you might answer yes to both or three of them, but you've chosen the main one, which I think is a, is a reasonable one. So this is how we're going to, um, to do this. Um, the other important part is um, that you will be able to ask those questions. In that application, in the part of the questions, you can pose those questions because they may not necessarily come out here or there is something absolutely pertinent and something that's burning in your, in your head that you absolutely are dying to ask. So please write it. Please write it in the application and my team will be able to screen those, signal to all of us that here is a brilliant question that absolutely needs to be asked and needs to be answered. If needed, we can do a poll on all those. Now, I have a colleague who is Michele Galatola. Maybe you can stand up and, well, he's the mastermind of the whole scheme anyway, but he will be the one who will be screening all these questions and in case something brilliant comes up, he will signal to us and say, well, here is the question. How about asking that? We will be able to do that either directly to our, um, uh, our discussion panel or do it in a Slido application. We'll just choose it uh, as, as we go. So with this, um, I would like to go back into the substance and to say that uh, today we have a um, small but wonderful panel um, uh, of um, of, of a good diversity, some coming from public administration, international administration, some coming from uh, research, some coming from business, and that is practice. Uh, I hope it's a good mixture that will show you different angles to, uh, to the footprint uh, pilot. Uh, the first uh, on the panel that I have is Dr. Wayne Visser, who is Professor um, of Integrated Value and Chair in Sustainable Transformation in Antwerp Management School. I'd like him to come on stage and to do the presentation. And after that, remain on the panel as then we'll be going on with another speaker. So please, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great pleasure to be here, and especially to those 6% of you who are interested in hearing interesting people talk. Um, it's good to speak with you today. Um, before I get into content, I always like to start with uh, how do we share knowledge today? Because especially when you stand up on a podium, it's worse if you have a title like professor, then there's some kind of assumption that you're at the top of a knowledge pyramid and you're sharing your great pearls of wisdom with the masses down at the bottom. Uh, and of course, I don't believe that's how learning happens. Learning is more like the tree on the right. Perhaps some of us who speak share a seed or build a trunk, but then really these next three days can go in all the directions of the branches as we share experience with each other. And the way that I do this with my students, and I try to do it also at conferences, is to adopt a query method uh, to say that we always start with a question, we then share our understanding, bearing in mind that whatever I say, whatever anybody says, is always one personal understanding of the topic. Sharing examples really makes it concrete. Reflections makes it personal. Uh, and then hopefully some insights of what might have been something new that we haven't known before. And I'll follow that method today as well. So the question for me that I was asked to really talk about is can we create markets that will support the creation of integrated value? 
So this is taking a slightly big picture approach, as you might expect, uh, perhaps from academia, placing the environmental footprint in the context of future trends, especially on this question of how we measure value in society. And to begin with, something of my understanding then, a lot of my work has been tracking how value is changing in society. And especially working a lot with business, not only as an academic, but also when I set up and ran KPMG's sustainability services, there's still a dominance of shareholder value, of value for owners of capital. And yet this changing dialogue began already in 1984 with the introduction of stakeholder value, Ed Freeman. Uh, it's been a long time that we've started to consider other sources of value in society. Interesting, of course, always that very seldom does environment appear itself as a stakeholder. It's the silent stakeholder. And so we have to find proxy voices for that silent representative. And it's gone through various evolutions. So the idea of multiple capitals going beyond financial and manufactured capital, already with us in 1992, an economist, uh, environmental economist, Paul Eakins, introducing the idea of also social and um, environmental capital, very important. So natural capital is really where environmental footprint is coming out of today, so many years later. And then we saw an evolution towards looking for the synergies between those different forms of capital. So what, for example, is sustainable value? The academic uh, Stuart Hart talks about this. Could there be a, an area where clean technology, pollution prevention, base of the pyramid, which is really strategies for inclusive economies, uh, and product stewardship all come together to create a new kind of value? Up until today, uh, the area that I work in of integrated value, is there a way that we can find the synergies between these different forms of capital? So we've seen very excitingly new business models emerging, we've seen new measures come out of that, and we've definitely seen a lot of innovations. And I'm just gonna share a tiny, tiny glimpse of that this afternoon. But we've also created for ourselves a dilemma when we look at all the data that's being reported on sustainability today, um, there really has been a proliferation. This study by KPMG, it's called Carrots and Sticks, shows that uh, in 71 countries, we have uh, 383 reporting instruments. Now that's pretty overwhelming if you're a company, especially if you're a small company. Um, and you'll see that the most of those are mandatory. So that tells us that policy is becoming more important, but it's had several consequences. Of course, it means we have more data than ever before. But the problem is a lot of that data is less material. In the early days of reporting, those that did report were only those where their impacts were so clear that they had to report on them. Reporting actually came out of the chemical industry initially with responsible care in the 1980s when there were lots of chemical explosions and other accidents. And they were forced to report on their most material, their most significant impacts. Now with standards like the Global Reporting Initiative and others, we find many companies just reporting on something because it's mandated or a voluntary standard says that they should report on it. So we get more noise less signal. We also have the problem today where the data is less comparable than ever before because of this proliferation of standards and codes and guidelines. Um, and also for another reason, most of this data is inaccessible. Not that you can't find it, but where do you find it? You find it locked up in PDFs on websites, the least comparable way for information to be. It's not in a way that you can easily cross compare between companies, between products, between countries. And so the question is, is it actually less useful? On the positive side, we have seen the emergence of new methodologies, not only the environmental footprint, but 
The big four accounting firms are starting to really take this seriously. I've just picked two. Uh, PwC has their total impact measurement um, and management tool, and KPMG has their true value methodology. And what's important about these is we're starting to see a move now from quantifying physical impacts, greenhouse gases, water consumption, and so on, to the externality costs of those impacts. What is the financial or the economic cost that is being imposed on society by having an increase in carbon or by utilizing a scarce resource or increasing pollution? And this is an extremely important step. The problem is that it's very much an experimental stage. These are pilot methodologies, and so there's no consistency between them. What we see is a few companies voluntarily taking the lead on this, allowing themselves to be evaluated in this way. And perhaps most worryingly, there is a potential that these methodologies will also be abused. If you take, as an example, the KPMG methodology on the right there, what you see is it starts out the blue, light blue lines are normal financial measures, uh, revenue less cost equals financial earnings. But then the uh, orange is adding in economic impacts that are positive, like paying taxes, creating jobs, investing in infrastructure and then subtracting negative impacts, especially the costs of corruption. The red lines there are adding in social positive impacts. For example, when you invest in healthcare or you invest in uh, training of your workforce, and then subtract the negative impacts such as using sweatshop labor or the health impacts of pollution. And same with environment, adding in positive impacts such as re using renewables or or cutting down on waste, um, but then negative impacts of pollution, of uh, use of fossil fuels, greenhouse gas emissions, and so on, and landing up with a financial number, which they call true earnings. And I wonder if you can see the danger. I've already seen companies start to use this to say, well, so long as we're creating that great, big, positive economic impact, we can trade that off. Yes, we have a negative environmental impact, but on balance, it looks great. We're contributing to society. And we know because you're all sustainability experts in the room that we're completely dependent on our ecosystem and it can't be traded off in this way. There's then another question, which is can we go beyond costing the impacts of those uh, uh, activities that we have? the impacts on society, to actually measure the positive contribution to value in what I call integrated value. And the two flowers, which you won't be able to read from the back, are simply my framework, one way to look from a systems thinking point of view at where we create or destroy value in society. And it turns out that there are five main areas where society is breaking down. So I call them destruction. Um, disruption, disparity, uh, disconnection, and discontent. But there are also counterforces, positive innovations that happen to, uh, to make sure that we, we deal with those impacts. And those are solutions that are secure, that are smart, shared, sustainable, and satisfying. The most interesting thing in, in, in my work and the trends that I see is that the real value gets created in the intersection between these areas. So how do we start thinking about not just the environmental footprint, which for the most part sits within that destruction part of this particular framework. It's the negative impact we're having on the environment. Firstly, how do we move it to the positive side? How do we measure the positive footprint? And then, even more difficult, how do we measure the synergies? How do we measure the positive impact when we combine a sustainable solution with a smart solution? Um, and I'll, I'll say a word more about that as well. The other question that comes up is, do we need quantitative KPIs that are always let's call it performance or physically based? 
Or is perception more important? If, if you are perceived as an organization or as a company as creating or destroying value in these different areas, is that a better or truer or more widely acceptable measure? Or do we find new KPIs that actually measure that point of integration? These are all open questions for which we don't have an answer yet. So moving on to some examples from, from my own experience, I've just finished uh, filming a documentary. It came out, in fact, yesterday on Earth Day called Closing the Loop about uh, uh, circular economy. It's the first feature-length documentary on circular economy in the world. And one of the cases that we featured is Dutch Awareness. It's a company that does circular textiles. And one of the innovations they came up with is a CCMS, a circular content management system. And working with them through the filming, it became very clear that there are some huge challenges to getting that necessary data to have a truly circular, transparent track and trace system, which is what this is. For one thing, on that system today, which has been running now for about two years, there are 350 companies. And for each product line, you need a minimum, on average, of 24 companies or organizations to be involved to get the necessary data to have a full life cycle impact. Uh, and so the complexity of that is one of the challenges we really face. I do believe the environmental footprint will help with that. Um, but when I speak to Dutch Awareness about what's been difficult, they've said that companies do not really want to share their, val their, their, their indicators. They, don't, they say they want to be transparent, but when push comes to shove, they don't really want to share their data. And so we'll probably come back to that in the discussion. Um, the other example, which I won't go into, is uh, an example of Port of Antwerp uh, and, and others that are coming up with a, a, a kind of uh, digital platform for sharing information. And I think this is something we have to think about with new methods like environmental footprint. How do we integrate that with digital trends such as blockchain? Again, I expect we might come back and talk about that. I was talking at Friday, on Friday at the European Policy Center on how we bring together digital trends and sustainability or circular economy trends. That's happening and we need to think about the implications. Reflections from my own personal experience, just two. Uh, the one is in my time with KPMG. I remember a client where already in 1998 we did full cost accounting for them. We looked at the environmental cost of some of their activities. And it was a great surprise to me because we already had the methodologies then that this wasn't something that was widely adopted uh, in, in the coming decade or so. And I think one of the things that happened is sustainability reporting came along, which is the physical quantification, not the financial quantification. And that's much easier to do. And so for 20 years, we got distracted with that. It's an important step, to be sure. But only now we're starting to come back to say, can we still measure those financial costs of externality? So the power of inertia is something we have to think about. I think one of the other reasons it never went to scale very quickly is the cost of measurement. So yes, we were able to do that for them as a client, but it was expensive as an exercise. Again, something that I know the environmental footprint Method has been working hard on saying how can we bring down those costs of measurement and of verification. And of course, at that stage, and perhaps still today, the method uh, credibility was not there because everybody was using their own different method. On the right there, I just uh, had another client that uh, did a cost-benefit analysis looking at the social and environmental and economic costs of a particular mining activity where they were going to wipe out most of a mountain, uh, which had some rare biodiversity species on it. And the result of the cost-benefit analysis was, well, we'll just protect another mountain somewhere wipe out this one, and on a cost-benefit basis, everything looks like it's neutral. Uh, and so we have to really worry about and think about 
um, whether these methodologies give us a true view of impact. So the last uh, insight I really want to share with you then, um, there was a bit of a controversy recently in, in the papers uh, because MIT came out with a study about electric vehicles versus ordinary cars. And I had a student pose this question to me uh, regarding controversies that exist to solutions that are deemed to be sustainable, e.g. electric cars. How can we determine the signal from the no noise? And so I, I wrote about that. But what was interesting to me is that um, the, the reporting of that study by MIT, which was done by the Financial Times, actually was a misreporting. So the methodology was very clear, very scientific uh, by MIT. And in fact, the, the misrepresentation was to the extent that um, the MIT researchers wrote to the FT and said, we are dismayed, sir, how your big read article, Green Driving's Dirty Secret, turns the fundamental conclusions of our research at MIT on their head, giving the public a misleading perspective on electric vehicles. As researchers working to uncover and share accurate information, we are saddened to see our results used in this way. Um, and so I, I just want to end then with that parting message that yes, methodologies are important. Yes, quantification is important. But at the end of the day, we have to think also about storytelling, about narrative. How are we communicating the, these results? Um, because it's very easy, especially when you've got a complex methodology for the media and others to cherry pick the sorts of results that, that they want to communicate which are not necessarily accurate. So I'm very much looking forward to hear more about this very important uh, development. I think it's a huge step forward, and I hope that indeed it will be a shake-up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Visser, for this. Um, um, well. It's an opener already, and uh, the shakeup that you have just mentioned is really uh, the one that ideally would like to see as a result. But then we have to start really sometimes from the basics. And uh, maybe before going to the next uh, uh, member of the panel, I'd like to ask my colleagues here to probably ask a question and do another poll and to see, do we really do it ourselves? And can I ask, for instance, a question uh, that would sound like that? Do you buy green? Is there a chance to? Ah, well, here we, well, here we see, in fact, um, quite interesting questions from the audience, um, asking why Commission isn't doing its work on non-financial um, reporting non-financial information. We'll have to say that we do, but uh, well, let's see what um, uh, other people uh, consider um, in this respect. Also, how do you trace back the commodities in the markets and, and a few other complicated issues. But is it possible to have a poll? Um, I'd like to see if people really feel that they are empowered to do something and do they really practice it. So my question is, do you buy green? All right, it will take probably a few minutes to set up the system. And meanwhile, while we consider that very complicated question, even though the answers would be yes or no, well, let's just see what you do. And, well, interestingly enough, people keep changing their mind, or the audience keeps changing their mind as a collective exercise. But I think it would be fair to say that most of us would do that. So, we do that. Or we say we do that. Or we think we do that. We think we buy green. But do we really know? And um, maybe we can ask yet another question, if possible. I mean, we buy, but how do we know it's green? How do we know it's fair? How do we know it's circular and sustainable? So can we ask yet another question? Did you ever feel cheated regarding the environmental features of a product? 
have ever been cheated. I mean, apart from those who have been buying a car of a certain kind, we'll leave that behind in history. Do you feel anything else? So, um, well, the fact that three quarters of us buy green, let's see if we have any feelings about it. Have we ever been, been cheated? Or have we ever felt that we've been cheated? Yes, sometimes. Sometimes I get cheated. Yeah. The question is, what do we do about that? But I think what's getting here as a picture is that, yes, we feel that it does happen. It does happen. Nevertheless, we buy green. So it's interesting to combine all those, that even though sometimes I get misled, even though I know it's not necessarily true what is being said, I buy that. I, I have that perception that, yes, sometimes I get wrong information or wrong claim. I think this is, this is one of the crux of the matters here um, on this topic, is to really answer to the right of the people to know what they are buying. Because we, when we buy something, we want to know how to use certain things. Whether the service that we buy is the service really that is delivering to us. But the label that is put on it, is it really a true one? Am I being told the truth? And I think here we can clearly say that, yes, things happen. Things happen. Of course, there is 16% that believe that they have never felt cheated. Okay, the other question is, do you know that you've been cheated? But at least they haven't felt, so the feeling isn't there. And good for these people, you have a quiet conscience, but the majority is, is, is having troubles here. So, thank you very much for this. I think that tells uh, quite something about where we are with the reality, and let's also remember that we are a rather informed audience here, because there are people out there who have never probably given a thought to that. And the question is how to make them think about it. Now, in order to go into, um, into wider areas and to, um, to, to go into the wider oceans, in the, into the wider um, universe, I'd like to now invite um, Mr. Tim Kasten, who is Deputy Director um, of the United Nations Economy Division to share his thoughts. How is that seen through a bit more global perspective? Mr. Kasten, please. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, and also thank you for your questions that help uh, to introduce my own topic. Um, which is really about reliable data, part of which is about reliable data and science-based information. Because your first question is, do I buy green? Well, it depends. It depends on what is green and whether I have the information to make that determination. And then, have I been cheated? Well, again, it depends. Do I know I've been cheated? If I know I've been cheated, yes, then I wouldn't be too happy. But uh, too often, I think we may not know. And thus, uh, this very important topic. Participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. A lot of the work that we do in the UN Environment Program Economy Division is indeed aimed at bringing environmental considerations to the economy. So much of our work is in fact to ensure that markets are green. Today I'd like to share a vision, our vision of a green market. In short, a vision in which all decisions and transactions in the market take into account the full range of environmental impacts on resources, on toxicity, on health, and on climate, as well as the social and economic considerations. To do this in the economy division, we work in three main areas, what we call the three Ds, to decarbonize the economy, to decouple and to detoxify. That is to say, we decarbonize the economy, we work to decouple the economy from resource consumption and environmental impacts, and we also work to detoxify the same economy. The links to several of the sustainable development goals are obvious, and perhaps most clearly to SDG 12 and its targets on sustainable consumption and production, as well as many others. 
We do with this with approaches that are science-based, that consider a systemic perspective, approaches that work globally and through partnerships to capitalize on the UN Environment Program's convening power to scale up action in short time frames and to make strategic interventions for change. We work to decarbonize the economy through supporting climate mitigation, through supporting climate technology and innovation, by promoting renewable and energy efficient policies, and supporting climate finance and investment. We work to decouple economic growth from resource use and environmental impacts through supporting green economic development at the country level, through increased investments in sustainable economies, through enhanced institutional capacity of public and private sectors, and supporting innovation and solutions for a circular economy. Finally, we work to detoxify the economy through the promotion of sound management and chemicals and waste, through institutional strengthening, capacity building, and technology assistance, and through addressing pollution and promoting environment and health integrated action. A green market is fundamental for an inclusive, circular green economy and is characterized by sustainable consumption and production. The two essential cross-cutting enablers for a green market are the definition of what is green, defined by reliable data and methods, as well as the necessary access to capacity to ensure no one is left behind. The EU's environmental footprint is a significant step in the right direction in supporting a common yardstick to measure green with life cycle knowledge. Now to deliver our vision for a green market, we need bold and comprehensive application of this life cycle knowledge and capacity by all stakeholders. Regulators, producers, consumers, and financers. The key areas of action by the different actors in the market must cover supply and demand, as well as the market rules, pricing, and financing mechanisms. An enabling policy framework by the regulators, including fiscal mechanisms and getting the prices right to ensure a level playing field. Sustainable procurement by both public and private sectors to incentivize the market. An industry that considers and minimizes the externalities of its products along the whole life cycle and innovates towards sustainable consumption and production. Consumers who make informed choices and decisions with robust, fair, and transparent information and are aware of their lifestyle choices. And finally, financers who integrate sustainability into their decision making and pump investment into actions that enable the inclusive green economy and sustainable consumption and production. In addition to being science-based and systemic, we need the efforts to go international, particularly in terms of the two cross-cutting enablers, robust knowledge based on international consensus and capacity to leave no one behind. Such a science-based, systemic, and international approach is where the UN Environment Program plays an increasingly important role. Two key partnerships hosted by the UN Environment Program in this area are the Lifecycle Initiative and the Global LCA Data Access Network, or GLAD. Very nice acronym for those of you that like acronyms. With the support of many partners, including the European Union and many others, including you in this room, we are putting this knowledge together in a life cycle knowledge sharing platform, integrating the work of Life Cycle Initiative and the Global LCA Data Access Net Network. We trust this future platform will contribute to the foundations of a green market. Another key global partnership through which many of the elements for a green market are being delivered is the One Planet Network. The One Planet Network has formed to support the 10-year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production. The network is a multi-stakeholder partnership for sustainable development that leads and provides solutions 
for the shift to sustainable consumption and production. All programs and their activities are based on a systemic life cycle approach. UN Environment Program is actively engaged not only as a secretariat for this network, but also in the six thematic programs that you see here. Sustainable food systems, sustainable buildings and construction, sustainable tourism, sustainable public procurement, sustainable lifestyles, and sustainable consumer information. We refer to these as the accelerators for the One Planet Network. Much of the work with the supply side of the market is done through our work on eco-innovation and on sustainable value chains. Eco-innovation promotes a systemic innovation based on holistic, science-based life cycle approach throughout a company's operations, products, both goods and services, processes, as well as a market approach and organizational structure. It aims at influencing and evolving stakeholders along the entire value chain and building and fostering collaboration for the identification of innovative solutions based on this life cycle knowledge. Indeed, the business case for eco-innovation will only grow stronger as regulations tighten, reputational pressures increase, and natural resources become even more scarce. That's why the UN Environment Program has been implementing the eco-innovation approach with 45 companies around the world in a project funded by the European Commission, from a chemicals company in Egypt to an agri-food business in Vietnam, to help them examine their value chains and develop new and sustainable business strategies. And it's also why we're working with policymakers in Colombia, Kenya, Peru, and Sri Lanka, among other countries, to help them create a policy environment that supports eco-innovation. The work on eco-innovation is a good example of the emphasis put on capacity development through learning by doing, with a focus on micro and small enterprises and in developing countries for emerging economies. This capacity development is indispensable to ensure that no one is left behind. The benefits brought by the knowledge of the environmental footprint and the approaches supported by the life cycle initiative, such as eco-innovation, must be accessible as a public good. In terms of transferring the transforming the market to green, the role of institutional procurement, be it public or private, is fundamental. Sustainable public procurement is the process whereby organizations meet their needs for goods, services, works, and utilities in a way that achieves value for money on a whole life basis. In terms of generating benefits, not only to the organization, but also to society and the economy whilst minimizing and if possible avoiding damage to the environment. In the case of public procurement, it brings together the procurement and the policy arms of government and harnesses the government's immense buying power in favor of sustainable development goals. UN Environment is very active in sustainable public procurement and is leading the one co-leading the One Planet Network program and developing a methodology for the indicator in target 12.7 of the SDGs. Exercising consumer power and navigating through the various sustainability labels within supermarkets and other areas can be challenging for the consumer. Searching for the product for product information can be overwhelming, and I'm sure many of us can sympathize with this photo. According to the EU market research, 84% of EU citizens include environmental considerations in their purchasing decisions. However, only half of them currently trust manufacturer and retailer claims about the environmental performance of their products. Going back to the survey that we've just taken a couple of answers from a wider audience, perhaps. But it's not only the consumers that are challenged. Producers today, besides mandatory regulations, have to comply with a plethora of sustainability standards. Again, it is extremely important that these standards and labels convey reliable, science-based, and comprehensive systemic messages to consumers in order to build their trust in products and producers. Therefore, it's important to follow globally agreed principles 
where we can ensure a level playing field and communicate in a reliable, fair, and transparent way. Reaching people and harnessing lifestyle decision making has huge potential. It requires recasting messaging and strategic engagement with opinion and culture influencers. None of us wake up in the morning thinking, today I'm going to harm the environment. Nor do we wake up thinking, I'm going to do something good for the environment. Maybe, maybe some of us do, but not every time we get up. We wake up in the morning expecting to live our daily life. So our common future depends on how we choose to live, how we choose to work and play. As global consumers, how do we run our homes? What food we eat? How do we get around? How do we relax? What we buy and how we care for our planet. The amount of stuff people use in many parts of the world has shot up enormously. While in others, many are still struggling to meet basic needs. Knowing how to measure lifestyle progress is a challenge. Footprinting tools are needed for a comprehensive lifestyle assessment. And the progress with the knowledge and the approaches discussed here are a good step forward. This science-based systemic footprinting will help us to target messages to the key hotspots of our lifestyles. Those decisions driving most impacts and address potential trade-offs generated by alternative ways of meeting our needs. Finally, changing finance sector in order to finance the transition, transition to sustainable consumption and production is an essential element for a green market. The UN Environment Program Finance Initiative has been working on this for a number of years with insurers, bankers, and investors. The efforts around the environmental footprint and related science-based systemic life cycle knowledge will surely help inform the environmental and social consequences of specific investment options. Legislation on sustainable finance may then consider this tool when defining the duty of investors and financial advisors to inform financial decision making. I'd like to conclude with some final reflections on getting us to the next level. First, again, ensuring a good science base through a balance between rigor and pragmatism. We must assure high quality information, but we must also recognize that this might be hard for some to follow in the beginning. Being more inclusive, leaving no one behind, may require lowering the initial entry bar while bearing in mind the need to raise that bar over time to ensure that the quality of data and approaches is appropriate and good enough. We need to think of the whole system, but perhaps target action to the key influencers, influencing key actors such as the legal duty of investors and financial advisors to take environmental and social considerations as well as client sustainability preferences into account when advising on or taking financing decisions as noted in the new EU action plan for sustainable finance. Ensuring that the public sector leads by example by including life cycle considerations in their procurement processes. And finally, to foster global partnerships. European efforts may benefit from a wider scope and global reach. Thus, partnerships hosted by the UN system and others may help to bring these efforts to fruition, those such as the One Planet Network and the Life Cycle Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, the environmental footprint approach is a very robust step as an enabler of a green market. Now this needs to be taken forward and translated into policy while also ensuring a global approach and capacity development to leave no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this uh, global view. Um, I like to quote a, uh, one of the politicians in my own country who um, likes to say that you cannot cook your own soup in a common pot. And I think this is exactly what we're trying to do here, is to see how we can um, adapt our tools for 
measuring something that is probably applicable and needed and pertinent anywhere because people live very similarly, people consume very similarly, people, in fact, they try to converge into, into that very same fashion, and therefore, what we will be coming out here from with um, probably will be uh, applicable and useful elsewhere. Now, um, before going to the next speaker, can I also maybe try yet another um, uh, poll uh, to be a bit populistic and to try to sense the audience and uh, because I think it would be relevant to uh, uh, introduction to that. Um, can we ask audience um, to respond to a question like that? How important are environmental features of products for you? And there we would probably have um, um, several uh, possibilities for answer. And uh, uh, whether the first priority would be price and equality, or environmental features. Um, what is really that that drives you when you make a purchase? And considering that we have here a rather informed and demanding audience, I think we are still back to, uh, to the same things, that all people care in the first place is the price and the quality. And probably if you would translate this into an ordinary, a classical consumer, you would most possibly get the green part even bigger. And yet, when we look into other features, the environment um, also comes um, as an important one. Again, that's among a rather informed audience, but yet it's still lesser of an importance than, um, than we have for the price. And I think that comes down to the whole basic thing, is that people, first and foremost, do care about, about that. And that's why it's very important to talk to those that know the market, that practice it, that sell, and that try to probably also set some trends in it. And that's why I'm very, very happy that among us also we have... Um, um, someone from the um, uh, Colrit uh, retail group, and that is Mr. Stefan Gotthard, who is director of Fine Food, who would like to invite to, uh, to the uh, podium and... Uh, no? Ah! Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, I probably jumped too fast uh, into this, but uh, we have, well, himself, Mr. Jeff Colroyd, who hopefully would be able to share with us some of the secrets of how people buy and, in fact, also how retailers choose what to sell and how to sell. So, Mr. Colroyd, please. Good afternoon. Ah, the other direction. No. Yes, haha. <laughs> so, good afternoon. On this picture you see Johan, Johan Münster, one of our colleagues who is uh, at the di distribution center, who is uh, fueling a forklift with green hydrogen we are producing on site. Um, and to date we have 150 of these hydrogen powered forklifts and we're opening for our first public station. There are not many hydrogen cars yet, but they will come. I hope. Um, presenting the company, so it's a family company um, starting in early 1900s when, where my great grandfather Joseph had a bakery, had 11 children and was a widower. His second son, Franz, who was an entrepreneur, became a wholesaler selling colonial goods out of the bakery. And on this picture you see Franz with his nine children, together with his wife. And out of there grew a full-fledged retailer active in Belgium, Luxembourg and France. And today we're at the, the fourth generation uh, with 160 almost family shareholders 
all very active in the sustainable way. So we'll hear that later. So in our history, the company went almost broke for three times. First during the Second World War, then at the end of the 1950s when the supermarkets appeared, and in 1985 when we grew too fast with too little money available and we underestimated the hard discounters. So, but we survived. And to survive, we had to reinvent ourselves by being active, positive, and creative. An attitude we still promote today to tackle the challenges of the future. We are a value-based, value-driven company. Simplicity and entrepreneurship drive us. And our goal is to create a 5P added value. Some numbers, 536 owned stores, 253 collect points, and a number of retail chains, almost 30,000 members of personnel, and last year we opened 23 stores. And we also invest, you can see it's small there, Aeoli and Parkwind in offshore and onshore energy, solar and wind. The solar is onshore. Okay, some of our history. So in the 1960s, in order to survive, uh, we had to be cheaper than our competitors, and at the same time we wanted to survive, so we had to be very cost efficient. That meant using as little electricity and energy as possible, to have as little waste as possible, and this experience formed our culture. And in the 1990s, on the left side, you can see oh, at the beginning of the ecologic awakening, let's say, we realized that not using is sustainability in its purest form. Out of that realization, we developed our Green Line Charter with a clear ambition on prevention of energy use, sustainable packaging, recycling, and mobility. We even launched a green label for organic products and products, products with an improved greener status. You can see the label on the left. So the green line label was visible on the shelves in the stores so the customers could make a more environmental friendly choice. A product that changed content, we gave that label for six months and then it disappeared again. Uh, the Belgian consumers know that we never offer plastic bags at the checkout. Now we, may, we are a step further. We recycle our waste cardboard and transform it into folding boxes that we sell at one euro. And last year we sold 610,000 boxes. And in 1999, on the right side, we built our first wind turbine on site in Halle. And today we have uh, 770 megawatt of uh, uh, wind energy available. In 2001, we opened our first organic BioPlanet stores uh, store, and today we have 6,000 organic references with a network of 27 stores and 79 pickup points. Um, recycling, today we recycle. 82.7% of the return volumes which are offered for recycling or get another useful application. So 82.7%, which is not too bad. Um, our mission statement. In 2005, we decided to clarify our values, our vision, our mission statement and our, uh, formulate a new strategic plan for the future. It was a lot of work. It took us two years with the involvement of management, of co-workers, of the board of directors, of shareholders, of customers, of suppliers. So it took us about more than 50 days of workshops. And the mission statement is together we create a sustainable added value through value-driven craftsmanship in retail. As you can read, we embedded values and sustainability 
even more into our activities by integrating it in our mission statement. And note that for us, values and sustainability are interconnected. They are even inseparable. Just like integrity, I act according to my values and authenticity. You experience that my actions are according to my values are linked together. So values and sustainability go together. And our logo is deliberately open because we are receptive to the outside world and we want to create because with all the complexity of issues, we cannot solve them alone. 2010, so almost 20 years after the Green Line Charter, it was time for a fundamental reflection on sustainability. We had a lot of discussions in, in, and interactions. What is sustainability? What are the criteria? Is it something that lasts for a long time? Is it something that is active and receptive at the same time, yin and yang? Something that transforms uh, on a long-term perspective? Something that our great grandchildren will be proud of? What is it? And we came with a new framework the first statement is, we accept that we are visitors on Mother Earth. She is our host. We'd better take care of her if you want a good life on Earth. If we don't, she will shiver, she will quake, she will shake until we are no longer there. As long as we take good care of our host, Mother Earth, we can create a society of humans and develop our collective consciousness. We can do things together, create a society of well-being. Our economic activity is a possibility we have to create welfare, to discover one's possibilities, to learn and discover together what we are here for. The economic activity has a potentiality for a positive contribution to a sustainable life on Earth. To create the world our soul aims for, we suggest the key is to do it with a positive attitude away from fear and neg negativism. And on a more personal note, let's stay humble because it's a long learning road to sustainable happy living. Okay, time for action. So into, in our approach of sustainability, we agreed as a team to shift from retail to a value chain approach. Uh, we felt most responsible for the retail side where we have a direct impact, reduce our impact, innovate, lead by example. And next to that, we are eager and willing to work in the full value chain and on a cooperation basis. So we included, we started to include our product portfolio in the indirect sourcing side, and up to now we have screened and improved 2,100 private label products on social, environmental, and economic fields. And fish was one of the first products uh, categories we tackled, and it turned out to be a real challenge. It took us about five years of work. Uh, consumption, we launched uh, this year and last year, uh, for example, uh, a campaign on joining hands to co combat litter with games and a call for movies for funny ways to throw rubbish into proper bins. And we want to help the consumer to make sustainable choices and trigger them to change behavior. And in that context, maybe the words of Confucius will seem relevant he says, well, he said, <laughs> if you want to plan for one year, plant rice. If you want to plan for 10 years, plant trees. If you want to plan for 100 years, educate children. Um, sustainability in the world, it's not... A, 
an ivory tower thing, let's look for a moment at what is happening around us lately. What is affecting us, what is influencing us. So I want to share the ma macro trends we see and we monitor. The first change we see is uh, for the next 10 years, it will be more and more the it's about me generation. We're moving from the us generation, the US generation, <laughs> to the us generation. And then we move to the I generation, to the we generation, to the us generation again, and to the me generation. At this point, for the next 10 years, we're in the me generation. Is it relevant for me as an individual? Can I, I have an impact? What we hear, what we see is that the ask for an open, transparent society, which is meaningful. They want sustainable living. They want living a healthy life together. There's the power of the network. If you as a business or a society don't do it, we will do it as a network. It's a tech-driven society. Phasinomics is coming more and more. One business can become the other, can become the other. And diversity is a team we all face and have to live with and work in and learn together. So with these teams, um, maybe I go back. The customer wants to make a more sustainable choice and be good for themselves, their network, the society and the environment as a whole. They ask for more openness about price, products and data. They want to be actively involved. They want us to recognize their experience and knowledge, to listen to them in order to co-create and contribute to a better world. Next slide. If you don't mind, I have a sip. So if we narrow sustainability team down to our sector retail, it becomes clear that the issues are major. There's a lot of going on, a lot of work. We need to feed a massive population in cities in a healthy and sustainable way. And general guidelines that are generic and based on academic research can help a lot in educating society. Remember Confucius. For example, the new upside-down food triangle of the Flemish government recommends what we should eat and in what proportions. And at the same time, at the same time, we see new scientific insights recommending personal nutrition based on personal preferences and needs, based on blood tests, intestinal bacteria, DNA, etc. And we expect these insights have the potential to seriously influence our food habits. Food as a service will become mainstream, we think, within the next 10 years. As an example, here you see on the picture our app, Smart with Food, which helps people in dealing with food intolerance and allergies. What we understand is that 20% of all house households have a member who has an intolerance or an allergy for one or more substances. So if you're the one doing the shopping, good luck. We think both approaches are needed. The generic combined with the specific, it is also a key factor for keeping our health services affordable. Um, Inspired by these trends and evolutions, we had to find a way to structure and manage the diversity of our own sustainability initiatives. Today we have 100, 150 projects and initiatives um, in our sustainability portfolio. With the sustainability board, who has a lot of work <laughs> trying to manage all this. Um, we organized it vertically projects related to the humans, projects to re related to uh, environment, and projects related to the product. And horizontally are four teams which 
customers told us, they said, that's important for me, for us. Health, society, animal welfare, and the environment. And in order to be able to uh, report, we use the sustainability goals, the UN sustainability goals. So each project is quoted with the sustainability goals. We manage it vertically and we communicate and relate to the customers on the horizontal base. And that helps and creates a lot of Okay. Yes. Um, if we want to collaborate with other stakeholders, we need to understand the whole chain and uh, each other's reference points. We need a common integrated view and framework to work with. So we are open to learn about them. The framework you see on the picture is that developed by the high-level panel of experts of the food security and nutrition. Um, and it was an eye-opener for us because uh, of its integrated nature and linked areas. And recently I heard that Commissioner Hogan intends to define clear targets on climate and sustainability. The environmental footprint program can play a key, key role in the new CAP, the Common ag uh, Agricultural uh, Policy. Other food for thought uh, is, can we shift from taxes to incentives or incentive policies in regards to reduction as a game changer? And the next one is, uh, Let's invest at the same time in innovation. And the third, let's develop possible ways to play wild cards, kind of a proof of concept framework. Uh, like in Belgium, we have the Fiscal Ruling Commission. So you can go with a project and say, OK, it doesn't fit really in the existing legal framework. But if we could have for six months or one year an exempt, exempt status, then we can make a proof of concept. And afterwards, we can see, do we have to adapt the legal side of it or not? That would create a lot of possibilities of developing it. And not always having to look over your shoulder if you take some risk or some, develop some new things. Uh, numbers. Go back. Yeah. Um, in 2008, we organized our first CO2 audit uh, with the greenhouse gas protocol, direct impact, and the result was an absolute emission of 96,624 tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, related to the turnover, it resulted in a relative emission of 16.48 tons equivalent per million euros revenue. And at the same time, we uh, formulated the goal to realize a reduction of 20% by 2020. Um, what we estimate is by 2020, we'll have a reduction of 34%. So we'll end at uh, 10.69 tons per million equivalent. Um, and the next plan, 2020-2023, uh, will uh, try to go to absolute reduction targets. Our reduction plan focuses on the following hotspots, heating, refrigeration, transports, and some examples is the liquid ice container with which we transport our goods, uh, which we developed ourselves, it took us about seven years to make it and to develop it. Um, low energy stores, uh, by the end of 2020, 205 stores will be low energy. And then the propane um, installation, refrigeration installations in all our stores. And that will contribute to the minus 34%. Okay, in 2011, we decided to respond to a call of the Commission to test the OEF and write an OEF sector rule for retail. And we did it together with a broad consortium of companies, which you can see on the slide. And we are very proud that, uh, and happy that it has been approved last week. 
Besides that, we started working on a practical method for footprint measurement and action in the value chain. Based on new methodologies, we call it chain environmental footprint. And since 2011, a, a team of five persons started working intensively on different projects, team existing of R&D specialists, sustainability sourcing specialists, purchasing, marketing, public affairs. We also had to hire external services from consultants, and it was an inten intensive learning period of about seven years. And I will show you some findings we had. And first, why did we do these investments and projects? Because we shared the belief of the European Commission that the shift uh, from niche to mainstream is necessary. There is also, this is also how we work in our own sustainability sourcing strategy. We want to know more about it and were triggered by some new impact categories you can see on the slide. Uh, for example, particular matter uh, and water. We were also keen to know how we can monitor our efforts in time. Is the rollout of CNG, compressed natural gas stations, visible in the particular model, uh, matter impact category? And what is the lowest impact possible of the production of wind turbines, for example? The organizational environmental footprint gives an helicopter view on the impact through the whole chain. And we learned that 40%, 45% of the impact is in the production side on the left, and 45% is in the consumption phase. Uh, less than 10% is in the retail phase, the customer transport, and the end of life. In the production phase, the greatest impact are resulting from uh, animal products. And in the consumption phase, the greatest impact uh, uh, products require uh, a lot of those requiring a lot of energy and water, which seems logic if you look at it, think about it. Yeah, of course. Do we have to do so much studies? <laughs> well, <laughs> apparently yes. We learned that we need to set up, up uh, set up different type of actions on different product groups in the value chain. So the the on the left, if you want to work on the left side, there's a different group of products if you want to work on the right side. So we're looking which way are we going, both ways or... Uh, we as a retailer can advise the consumer on how to reduce impact. For example, we do workshops. We have a Colorado Group Academy, a school for customers where we can uh, help them cook with leftovers, uh, have less energy use, and so on. So we would like the OAF footprint to become, first and foremost, an internal monitoring tool to measure progress of our activities. Comparing retailers does not make much sense because their products portfolios are so different. Oops, different slide. So, chain environmental footprint, what is it? In our search to make footprinting more tangible for our business, our R&D team tested our own end-to-end -end product category model, which combines company and product footprinting, and we call it the chain environmental footprint. The idea is very simple. Each actor at the end, in the end-to-end -end chain, uh, puts uh, in the system his own primary data. And in this way, we are linking computer uh, company uh, data, OEF, with the product data. Uh, each actor takes his responsibility to act on the hotspots, and we focus on reduction. And we then, once we had the model ready, then we tested it with suppliers, uh, and the aha lameness came. We can define indicators for reduction in the different chain links. We can also derive best practices that can inspire others. Suppliers are willing to collaborate if we protect the rough data, and small companies joined in some of these projects. 
and we worked out uh, 11 chain cases. Coffee, pork, apple, beef, packaging, diapers, and some others. These are the pictures. I will go into the diapers. So together with uh, partners in the value chain, we identified the hotspots and uh, did reduction scenarios uh, to develop a new product. All uh, factors were taken into account, improved quality, cost, use, and so on. So we managed to come up with a new uh, sustainability product which saves 400 tons of CO2, as you can read. And it took us about uh, one and a half year to make this development. Almost there. What do we need to scale up efficiently? First, we need to build and connect data platforms to scale up in a way that companies can plug in their own primary data in a safe and protected way uh, so that they can stay the owner. We expect that the blockchain technology will help. Next, uh, make benchmarks easily available by providing databases with set secondary average data which will have to develop reviews in that phase. Three, track reduction, so we can communicate to our customers in order for them to decide with insight. Four, combine nudging tools with communication tools. Five, choices have to be made. Will we go for a ma mandatory model or a collaboration model? with incentives to disseminate best practices. We think we prefer collaboration model. Six, how is the funding for concrete investments going to be organized, for example, for reduction at farm level or for new technologies? And the question is, can the new uh, FP9 program after Horizon 2020 support value chain reduction programs? And the consumer, what about the consumer? Where are they? It's clear they want to know the business, they want transparency, they want authenticity, but they also want to be helped, supported and guided in their personal sustainability life, style of living. They tell us, okay, Colrad, it's very nice what you do. Well, you get the license to operate, but I want to be more sustainable and I need your help. Give me ideas, give me clues how to do it. I need help. So we ask them, what is important for you? First thing, the heart is being healthy. Me, my family and friends. The second is, have a safe and energizing society to live in. Three, let's have animals who don't suffer unnecessarily. And four, a an healthy and nice environment. We connect with them on a variety, variety of online and offline channels. We try to reach them where they need most of the support. And we try to go first digital, as much as possible. And we also think education is key, and public-private cooperation can help. But there, sometimes, there's a trust issue, especially if you want to teach children no, there's also the supposition that businesses are, are, have always a second agenda. Well, when I was little, there was Coca-Cola coming to our school. I don't know if some of you remember. And we, had, we could drink a bottle of Coca-Cola. I remember. <laughs> so, our dream. Our dream is to be able to prove impact reduction to our customers, consumers, with an automated and simple chain measurement approach, benchmarked performance in the chain with average scores. This approach could become the foundation for our tree picture, well-founded and accepted by all. Then we can bridge the gap between 
product environmental footprint and the organization environment footprint and the consumer. Environmental matters can in this way also trigger competitiveness in a single market for, for green products. You don't need import tariffs. We will combine this approach with co-creation platforms with our consumers, new product tools and nudging practices. Maybe it's a bit naive, but we believe in it and we would like to go for it. And to end, we are convinced that we can do that together, step by step. Let's improve performance gradually, in a focused manner, in a strong partnership with academia, with businesses, with government, with citizens. So I would like to thank especially uh, Carmen Novella and his department for your proactive approach. We learned a lot, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chef Colorit, for this uh, exhaustive and uh, rich presentation. If we didn't know it would be coming from retailer, you probably would never guess it, it comes from retailer because uh, it shows so many facets that are not necessarily inherent or evident um, from the business point of view, that um, um, it's not always obvious uh, what um, angles businesses really see in, in all that. Now, I understand that you, uh, you have a colleague who will join us uh, in, uh, uh, in the panel, and that's Mr. Stefan Gotthard. This time I get it right. So please, please join. And uh, before, we, before we start um, our panel, perhaps um, we can ask audience, that is you, yet another question which could probably kickstart this, um, this discussion. And the question I'd like my colleagues to pose um, on the poll is, is this. I expect that companies with a sustainability strategy perform better economically too. Is it possible to ask that very simple question with not necessarily such a straightforward answer? Uh, the reason I'm trying to add, uh, ask this question and pose this question is that we've heard already from, from Jeff Colwright uh, say that, well, why do we need all these calculations if uh, profitability um, of being sustainable, being green, but in a true way, really makes business case. But yet we have this five years um, pilot to show that it is possible, and it probably does make sense. So, after all, and again, I expect that companies with a sustainability strategy perform better economically too. Well, I see quite lack of divergence of opinions here. Well, thanks for opposing um, the very obvious answer, but I think it is very clear what, uh, what we are seeing here. The answer is yes, that companies who have the strategy, they can combine it with a profit. And uh, perhaps using this opportunity, then I would like to ask you, Mr. Gotthard, how you interpret that? Why, again, in your uh, colleague Jeff Holwright's um, words, um, why do we still need to bring this from a niche idea to the mainstream, if this is obvious? if this is profitable and everybody believes in it. Profitability? Function? Yeah, okay. Profitability, of course, is, is uh, linked, I think, in this situation also to the fact that, as a company, it's part of, of a license to operate. I mean, if you're not convinced today, as a company, a small, a medium, or a large company, that you have to take care about sustainability, um, you don't have a, a, a bright future uh, ahead of you. Uh, on top of that, and that's something that we have proved over the, over the years, uh, and it takes time, it is true that it, it's part, if you can um, bring that into the culture of the company, um, it, it creates values, it's gonna give conf confidence also to the employees, to the, uh, to the customers, and um, yeah, 
um, and it will create value for the company. Yeah. Thank you. Well, looks like an obvious answer, but somehow, somehow it's not necessarily practiced or maybe there is something missing. Well, we felt that what is missing is the, is the common rules, is the common language. And in fact, quite an interesting remark here that I found also on the slide, one of you have asked, well, should we stop talking uh, about green? Uh, should we stop making it a common language? But perhaps we should start making it a common language, except it give it a different meaning and make sure that it's not, uh, it's not discredited. I have a question, though, from the other angle. Uh, now, Mr. Visser, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, you were in the European Policy Center discussing uh, the digital um, agenda digital economy. I have to say that I'm also a big fan of it, uh, if only for one reason, that when we, are, when we were designing the strategy for circular economy or wider sustainability agenda, we were also running uh, parallel digital agendas, but those don't necessarily cross each other. And yet there are many uh, possibilities, and uh, these possibilities are exponentially increasing. I have followed uh, the last Davos forum, just like some of us do from the web stream, and I have to say that I've downloaded probably like a dozen, around 20 various sessions, and there was not a single session where the word blockchain didn't come up. You mentioned it, also for good reason. Now, is there a, a way to use new technologies how we can communicate, well, if not only communicate, but also probably to measure uh, footprint. Do you have any ideas, wild ideas, something that we could probably take forward? Yes. Um, first, I also want to just respond to that uh, comment and, and to the poll questions. As an academic, I have to try to also be a little bit neutral. Uh, and we like to tell ourselves, especially if we're in business or we're consulting to business, that there's always a business case for sustainability and that consumers will always choose uh, green. If we look at the research across numerous studies, the question is not so, or the answer is not so clear. So what we know for sure is that very few customers choose green or sustainable over, over anything else. What we know is that it's very hard to say that companies that incorporate sustainability also have better financial performance. We see the exceptions, those that actually make it part of their mission and their business case. But across the whole market, what we actually see are that the most profitable and the largest companies in the world are those that actually have the least environmental responsibility. So, you know, we like to reassure ourselves here, but let's also do a reality check and say that at the moment the market incentives do not systematically reward those companies that are more sustainable. So it rewards for a little bit of sustainability, but if you're going to do a lot, that requires a big investment, as I'm sure you've made over the years, big investments. Most companies are not ready or rewarded to make those big investments. That's just uh, mm -hmm. a quick response to that. So on, on blockchain and, and other internet of things, artificial intelligence, what we call the exponential economy. Um, first, uh, one of the things I mentioned on Friday when I was talking about this was that we're in a certain stage of the hype cycle. Gartner talks about a hype cycle uh, with all of these technologies. We're just beyond the... Um, peak of inflated expectations. It's the second stage. First you get the innovation trigger, then the peak of ex expectations. We're about to go into the third stage, which they call the, uh, uh, the slope of, uh, of, of doom or of, uh, uh, of disappointment. Yeah? So what we think blockchain will deliver, we discover is it's not going to solve all our problems, for example. Uh, research done by Stanford, Stanford University on, on about 300 blockchain projects at the moment showed that two-thirds expected to deliver value within the next six months, but when you go into that and you look at of those which are environment and climate related, when you look at environment and climate and blockchain, that falls to less than 5%. So for most of our world, something like blockchain will, on current projects, will only deliver in more than two years' time value. Um, having said that, it, 
it's when I when I look at companies we're working with, um, and indeed we set up a leadership group on exponential economy looking at this. Um, everybody's gearing up for it. Um, when we look at track and traceability, I showed you the uh, example of the circular textiles. Um, that's using pretty basic things, uh, RFID tags. Um, it's very clear that if we can, that, that the technology is an enabler, but the, the block is actually getting the data first, which is why environmental footprint, if it is something that is not just a great recommendation, but becomes somehow a policy requirement, that will open up the, the technology to enable it. But without that, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out. If there's no good data, we don't have access, uh, it, it won't happen. So I think that's, that's really the, uh, where we're at at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, well, indeed, technology does not offer all the uh, possibilities. And what you said that even if two-year cycle is still um, too short on the one hand or too long for the others, uh, well, considering that businesses very often operate on annual basis, whereas what we're here aiming at really long-term strategies and, and interest, there is always this dichotomy and the conflict of how to, how to manage all that. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Kasten, um, in one of the also slider questions, um, one of those that came up was, um, why don't we limit ourselves simply to uh, carbon, waste, and water? In fact, um, when we uh, look at environment and when we think about environment, very often the first thing and the only thing that comes to the policy mind and where action is really taking is on carbon. And carbon, what we talk about really is, well, few... Um, uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in the first place, then methane in the other, and there we focus so much energy. There is so much going on there. Everybody talks about it, everybody makes investment. There are big political gatherings about it, and it's just one single angle to that. Now, if we add waste and water, that already gets complicated, whereas in the footprint, what we're trying to do, let me remind, is to look into the 16 uh, impact categories besides climate change. We'll talk about ozone depletion, we'll talk about the human toxicity, be it cancer effects or human toxicity, non-cancer effects, the particulate matter, the ionizing radiation, the petrochemical ozone formation, acidification, eutrophication, resource depletion, ecotoxicity, you name it. So it gets really complicated. And that probably doesn't cover even all those aspects. In fact, the other question that I've seen from the audience being asked is that, what about social sustainability? What about these other angles? Aren't they getting forgetting? Forget it. Now, since you are from the UN structure and you mentioned the sustainable development goals, and we have 17 of those, uh, well, what do you think, which direction should we go? Should we simplify and, and go into one or two parameters, or should we try to capture a lot more in order to show the real footprint of what we produce, what we consume? Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I think we need to go the more difficult route um, and see how we can capture some of these many other factors as well. The sustainable development goals, as you mentioned them, are in fact built on environment, economic, and social dimensions. Um, those are the dimensions, those are the pillars of sustainable development, and they all must be taken into account in what we're doing in, in terms of a footprint as well. Um, just as an example, one of the key things that you left out of your carbon waste and water is uh, minerals and materials. Um, to me, this is one of the um, perhaps, not immediately, but sometimes forgotten uh, factor that we need to take into account as well. When we look at decarbonizing, we're looking at energy efficiency, we're looking at um, renewables, we look at wind, solar. Where does all that energy get stored before we need to use it? Well, very often it gets stored in batteries. Um, and the more and more that we are increasing the efficiency of our batteries, moving into lithium and other things, requiring new uh, and, and vast quantities of minerals and materials that we were not looking at before. Um, and if we don't start looking at those things in an entire life cycle approach, including social dimensions, including economic dimensions, we will definitely uh, run out of material resource to do everything we want to do. Um, things such as social dimensions, when you take into account um, recycling, for example, recycling of electronics, 
Uh, many of these things are, many of these electronics are being recycled in developing countries under very poor social conditions. We need to make sure, that, again, we look into those social conditions so that when we come out the other end of our sustainable development goals in our agenda 2030, that we are truly coming forward with something that is sustainable development for all and leaving no one behind. Well, that shows that we have to go, indeed, a more difficult route. Now, um, I'd like to then ask a question, Mr. Uh, Gotthard, who is really, again, in the practice of it. Um, if we try to measure 16 parameters, and probably there are even more social ones included, and we have to apply that to thousands and thousands of various products, and probably even organizations, and in the future, who knows, the services, and by the way, some of you have also asked in the slide of the question about the um, links uh, between uh, uh, the uh, footprint and the taxonomy in the sustainable finance. And Mr. Jeff Colorate also was talking about the investors. Uh, indeed, we'll also have to develop some kind of a measurement for the financial process. But how do you ma manage all that? How do you manage all this incredible combination, very combination of various factors, thousands of products, possibly on your shelf, possibly as a choice for the consumer, with so many parameters. How do you do that in practice? It is indeed a gigantic uh, challenge. We have about 7,000 only private label mm -hmm. products. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we started looking at the chain OF approach, where we said, let's look at some reference products and try to determine the hotspots in that chain, because most likely some other relevant products in the same category, uh, they have the same hotspots. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, having the data is one thing, but what we want to do is also do something with the data and improve the ecological footprint. And I don't believe that you need to have all the data of all the 7,000 uh, mm -hmm. private labor products in our case before you start doing something. I think that's why we called our program Step by Step. Already with uh, the information that we have now, we can start making improvements. Mm -hmm. And it will take time, it will take effort. That's for sure. Another thing, and that is very crucial as well, we will have to share data. Uh, we have data, other companies have data, other retailers have data. We have to find a solution to share that information in a very reliable and efficient way, and that can give us a kickstart to, uh, to improve even faster. Can I then ask maybe another follow-up question? This is something that comes up very often in, in, in our conversations about the practicability. And I think, again, one of the questions that you have asked in the slider is about traceability. Because one of the tasks here is to make sure that those that produce something, that sell something, they're able to trace back the origins of the, of the good, the origins of the source, the origins of the minerals, of the materials that is being used, back into probably impossible abyss in the history because the global chains are, the chains are global, everybody's doing everything, uh, a product crosses dozens of times various borders and the markets uh, before it lands on the shelf or in the consumer's hand, but how do you trace back, how do you, make sure that the claim that you say, well, if it's fair, if it's green, if it's circular, if it's sustainable, if it's organic, if it's this or that, it's true if you can't really know where it all began. How, how would you do that? Because you already make those claims, uh, and many others make that. How, how can we credibly do this? I think there are several aspects. One solution could be in the future, of course, the blockchain. We talked about that. We don't believe it's going to happen tomorrow either, but there is definitely some potential. Uh, another way to go, what we are doing, is try to buy as much as we can locally. Because, of course, that is a lot easier for us to follow up, to audit. Um, and that's the, the third uh, approach, of course. We, we do quite a lot of audits ourselves in Belgium, also abroad in, in, in Asia and Latin America. But of course, we're, of course we're not there all the time, so we have to work with reliable partners. And that's the key, I think. We need to have good partnerships and work on it together. Mr. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Just referring again to the experience uh, in the textiles industry with the circular content management system, it seems what's clear is it doesn't work without partnership in a value chain. So. If you're going to have a transparent value chain, you need to get every 
company that's involved in that value chain to collaborate because you have to first agree which indicators to report and they have to all sign up and say yes we're prepared to report that and that's why when I when I asked uh, Dutch Awareness who created this I said how, how long has this taken um, I mean it's it's more than five years that it's taken to develop and to get agreement you can imagine in their case for textiles uh, chain 350 companies all to agree on the indicators um, and then it becomes a little easier because we talked a lot uh, with the European Policy Centre about this idea that also the EU is getting behind of a digital passport for products, a product passport. And so quite simply all that is is every time something moves, you know, you can already use very simple technology like RFID tags. Uh, it gets scanned so you know where it is, who it is, uh, and then they have to put in certain bits of data. And so long as that's agreed collaboratively, it's not actually that difficult. Um, but it has to be real time. And one of the s suggestions for policymakers as well coming out of that meeting was uh, start simple with who, what, and where. Yeah? So, you know, who's involved? Which, what's the player? Who's the player? Uh, what is in the product that they're putting? And where is it at that stage? And every time that gets put in in the chain, you start to get to that traceability. So... Technically, it's not actually that much of a challenge. The challenge is the collaboration and those partners agreeing to put their data in, which is why I come back to saying if the environmental footprint can make that a common measure, those indicators, and actually put a bit of legal pressure to say that all suppliers in the chain need to put this forward, then it becomes less of a negotiation and more of a, okay, we do it. Yes. Well, and, and indeed, this is probably, again, where these technologies, as you mentioned also, such as blockchain with the um, ledger uh, possibilities, link up with the ledger possibilities, which you can't really fake and you can trace back, is, is one of the possibilities, but is how to marry all those two worlds, uh, who, on the one hand, are the classical manufacturers, the other is, is a super high-tech idea, which is a totally new concept, how to, how to do business. And then the other question probably is, uh, why you know, should we do it again at the European level? Does it really make sense? Uh, again, if, if, if the um, value chains are global, if you can't really uh, do it um, purely locally, even though Colrate is trying, as you say, to, to buy locally, yet so many things really get linked up globally and, 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 and uh, tracing back, and then knowing where everything comes from and where it goes is really, is really difficult. So maybe a question to Mr. Kasten then, is it, does it make sense to do it in Europe alone? Should we not just go for a, some kind of a super product convention where we will try to capture everything? Since, okay, this planet is so interconnected, it's even more interconnected, that probably doesn't make sense to try to, again, cook your own soup in a common pot. Well, let me start by saying I'm not going to say that we need a super convention yeah. to do this. <laughs> um, I don't want the UN represented if you're being said, said uh, heard to say that. Um, but do we need something a little bit more broad? Yes. Uh, if we want something to be comparable, as I, as I mentioned about leaving no one behind, about making something global, about making something comparable and having the similar databases and knowledge bases upon which that we will base um, the, the information, base the systems, so that consumers anywhere will be able to know if I see something with a... Uh, particular type of label or a particular type of rating system or whatever it is that the way in which this policy is rolled out that I know that it's the same regardless of where it is. Um, I think that the, the EU uh, environmental footprint is definitely a good base and it's a very important start um, but it is something that we would like to be able to see go out more broadly and be uh, more widely applicable yes. by all means. Thank you. Um, then another question to Mr. Gotthard. In one of these presentations, what came out is a reluctance from businesses to share that information because if the scheme is to be successful, that information needs to be shared. It has to be pass passed on, whether under some confidentiality rules with the protection of intellectual property or purely transparently is probably still the question to ask. But how to 
give incentives to businesses to share the information. Why would they share? Why wouldn't they be interested in hiding some of the secrets that they have uh, in their internal kitchens? What is very important, and we noticed it every single time, is that to, it is needed to, to have a, a neutral partner in the uh, collaboration. Uh, could be university or, or uh, uh, another uh, neutral partner who uh, coordinated data. Um, we didn't have any issues to convince the partners along the chain to collaborate, but the issue was sometimes indeed to share all the information. But on the other hand, if they know that the purpose is to, to have more information and to being able to do some benchmarking, then it becomes interesting. But there again, you need someone who is neutral in the process, who can collect all the data and um, give some interesting feedback also to the partners who participate in the, in our case, the chain OF. Would that neutral, someone neutral have to be a public authority? Can it be private um, entity? I think both are possible. If no, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the importance is that it needs to be an organization that is reliable, um, not something, not the startup that is going to claim that he will do it. I think some uh, experience will be uh, very useful and necessary in this mm -hmm. case, yeah. but it could be public or private. I was probably then reading in your mind that when you say, okay, what needs to be reliable, that probably means that something or someone needs to be also transparent. Uh, can I ask maybe one of you to say, how do you see uh, the transparency imperative in this exercise? What can we do? Or maybe we shouldn't be doing too much about it, not to, to scare too many participants into this. Mr. Visser. Yeah, and indeed, this is what I also alluded to, is that many companies say that they w are in favor of transparency, when it, but when it comes down to it, uh, maybe not so much at, at the level we're talking about. So I think the two uh, main ways that we can incentivize this, the one is that we go with our modern technology the way of crowdsourcing. So actually companies already report a lot. Um, I mentioned a lot of that data is locked up in PDFs, but there are Initiatives like Wikirate, for example, it was an EU-funded project to set up a platform works similar to Wikipedia where the crowd actually starts sourcing the data, putting it on an open platform, and in a way that's comparable and that you can start to uh, reward or name and shame companies uh, or products, brands. And so I think it could very well go that way. Uh, that's a very powerful force to encourage uh, companies to, to be a bit more transparent. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the, the more effective way, I think, for, for getting um, standardization is, is a kind of policy nudge or a policy push to actually simply require this. You know, we, we started this environmental reporting journey at least back in 1986 with the... Um, toxic release inventory in, in the United States. And that was because of accidents and poor performance of the chemical industry. But since it became a requirement, there was no competitive advantage to hide that. You simply had mm -hmm. to. And, and also the, the government made it a requirement that it became public information. So then lots of NGOs started to map you can go into your local area and see which are the most toxic areas as a result of that. Uh, at the moment, we're missing that step. I noticed one of the questions coming through the forum this, uh, that we've got here was about the, why hasn't the EU made a real requirement for non-financial reporting? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there is the non-financial reporting directive, but it's, it's only saying that you must report. It's, it's not down at the level of the footprint, which is saying what you must report and in what format it should be, that it should be in a comparable digital format. And I think that's the next step that we need. Yes. Well, indeed, I can confirm that even the financial reporting, which seems to be the obvious one, is still quite controversial ones because sometimes businesses complain that they are maybe put at the wrong... Uh, 
level playing field vis-à-vis uh, -vis those that operate in transparent environment and those that don't necessarily do that. Uh, so there was quite an issue. But when you go beyond the uh, uh, financial, that becomes even more complicated. But uh, Mr. Kasten, what do you think about yes, this transparency? Just on the issue of transparency, yeah. I think that um, it, it's very important that, that we allow and not only allow, but of course, foster this, op this open information and transparency. I do understand how for private companies that may be scary uh, at times, mm -hmm. um, but I think if we create reliable, again, reliable science-based platforms, it will really assist in people being able to put information out there um, and in, in a transparent way. Information is available to all of us at all times. We're participating in this conference today mm -hmm. in, in real time. Um, we are being encouraged to use our phones to collect information and transformation and transfer information while we're sitting here. So there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of misinformation also out there. Um, and so the more transparency we have in the data we're, we are sharing and the more transparency we have in the way we're creating the databases and the science behind the database, the better off I think we're going to be. Uh, thank you very much. Well, that's, I think, sometimes rather self-obvious, but when you come down to uh, details there, it isn't. Then the devil is definitely in the details. I would like then maybe to pick up one the mark that Mr. Um, uh, Visser uh, said, but address it to Mr. Gotterat and maybe then ask you afterwards. And you said that uh, businesses still don't have incentive uh, to do um, the right things or to report that information or to follow. A, um, a, a sustainable um, behavior. Now, from your point of view, what would be the key um, workable, effective, possibly cost-effective solutions for incentives to businesses to go down that road? Huh. A very, very good question, very tough question also. Uh, it is true that it has cost us quite a lot of money. Uh, the last uh, couple of years, we spent almost a million just for this part of the uh, um, the analysis, and and we have some information we can work on, we can work with, but it's still limited. If you look at uh, the global number of products that we would have to to handle with, um, I do believe, as I mentioned before, I really mean it. It's it's uh, um, also a matter of your your license to operate. Um, so it is an investment as a company. Now, on the other hand, and Jeff mentioned it uh, in his speech, um, today we work a lot with, with uh, taxes on all kinds of mm -hmm. situations and products. Uh, it could be very interesting if we start uh, incentivizing uh, companies uh, to work on environmental footprinting, on analyzing the information, but then put the incentive on the progress to be made uh, if you have the analysis and you say, I have accurate data and now I will start improving my processes, my ecological impact, and put some financial incentive there, that could be interesting. Can you add to that? Yes, and qualify what I've said. So, I, there is, I think, uh, a business case for large branded companies. Clearly, uh, there are economic benefits of them going sustainable, uh, or at least appearing to be more sustainable. Um, they get lots of benefits, reputational, cost-cutting, and so on. We know this very well. Uh, the qualification is it's, it's that they only have to go a certain distance. They have to be a little bit sustainable, enough to get that social license to operate. And for most of the public, so long as there is enough of that, you've got the sustainability report or you've, you, you're doing some good things in the community, that's kind of enough to buy the social license to operate. But what we know from the science-based targets is it's nowhere near enough to be truly sustainable, to get to decouple, to get our, our society to where we need to be. So that's the incentive that's lacking, is, is to go fully circular, to go fully sustainable. When we talk about the unbranded small to medium-sized companies, there is almost no incentive at all. I mean, they, they may be caught up a little bit in some legislation requirements or through the supply chain, the big companies requiring certain things of them. And the only way we fix this is 
I think through uh, uh, through legislation that internalizes those externalities, that starts to price in those negative costs. But it it's at a scale and a level way beyond what we see with the, the taxes and, and incentives we see today. And if we take the smoking industry as an example, which has been highly regulated now for a couple of decades, with the taxes going up and up and up, um, today, and, and I've got this from one of the biggest banks in Europe, uh, globally in fact, if you want to make money, they're into sustainable investments, this bank, but if you want to make money, you still invest in tobacco. Yeah, so we've been completely unsuccessful in changing that incentive enough. If I think of my work with Cambridge University and you look at carbon pricing, work coming out of uh, the university suggests that to get to the kind of science-based targets we need, we probably need a, a, a price on carbon of about 100 euros per tonne, and we know what we're at today. Usually it's below 10. So. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about where at the moment the incentives aren't strong enough to really, to bring along everybody, which is your point. It's not only the pioneers like we've seen today, but all the rest. Um, can, can I then follow up uh, on this um, to all three of you? Um, so internalizing probably is the classical way to uh, internalize the cost. Um, and what you said, I think, is very symptomatic of uh, um, what this um, exercise is really about. I mean, you mentioned already a difficulty in putting the right price on one single parameter, that is the carbon. And carbon is just one of the many of the true cost, societal cost, that a production, consumption um, has on it. And we're trying to make it, of course, a lot more uh, complex. Uh, now, what is a smart way to do it? What, uh, you know, if, if you were to, um, let's say, have a full monopoly of all regulatory or policy decisions, what would it be for you? I mean, would you go for, like, examples for innovation, infrastructure, bans, regulation, information, anything else? What would be the, the key words for you? And, or what would be probably even the instruments for you? Who would... Okay. I, I'd like uh, to start. Yeah. Yeah, if I yeah. can. Uh, for for me, the the big issue, anyhow, is still data. There is still so much need for information for data that we don't have today, mm -hmm. and we'll find we'll have to find a way to collect that in a, a smart, intelligent way, mm -hmm. um, reliable information, and to make it easily accessible. Also, uh, that would be my number one. We need really need to uh, invest in uh, in data. Mm -hmm. And also make the link maybe with some, we haven't talked about that yet, but all the logos and labels that exist. Because in our uh, situation, uh, that is important if we go to our customers. Mm -hmm. And today there is not really a link between a lot of those logos or labels and in this case the environmental footprint. But it all starts, starts with data. Data would be the number one. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kasten. Thanks, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, <laughs> why, I agree. Don't you, why don't you data. try? <laughs> uh, data, information, knowledge base, mm -hmm. um, and sharing that knowledge is probably, in my view, also one of the most important things that we can do. Um, as I mentioned, producers as well, not a producer myself, but producers as well, need reliable information. They need to know where their uh, raw materials are coming from, what is the entire footprint of those raw materials coming in, in order for a producer to feel comfortable that what they are producing, in fact, meets an, a, a standard, whether it be a European standard or a global environmental standard. Once they feel comfortable with that, I, as a consumer, or any of us as a consumer, also then, with some kind of a footprint analysis, will be able to say, okay, I know that the information the producer based their decisions on is reliable because of X, Y, Z process. I'm therefore going to make my decision based on my, uh, my uh, interpretation of that process and what I believe in and what I feel is best for, for people and planet. So I think those two components, information for the producer and the information and knowledge for the consumer are the things that are going to be able to ultimately make us both sustainably consume, produce and consume. Okay, so we have data linked to that information, and the third one. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I agree with both, and uh, um, 
But if I think about how also change happens, uh, change is a movement and a movement depends on these tipping points. And so I think tipping points are often data informed, but if I look at what's happening in food since we had this case study and, and the importance of going to meet uh, low meat diets, for example, and I, I have this experience with my own children having this debate. I happen to be vegan, but they're not. And, you know, these fierce debates about how, uh, you know, perhaps I'm misinformed because, uh, you know, eating, eating meat is fine and so on. Uh, so I think if we can get, not only take the data, but um, package it in such a way that we have very clear answers to some of these big questions electric vehicles, I mentioned it. Yeah, so yes, we have mineral requirements, we have product, we have life cycle impacts of batteries, but at the moment we're a little bit like we were with climate change, it's muddying the water a lot. So that as a consumer I'm thinking, not me personally, but a lot of consumers are thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't go electric because it's not actually clear that electric is better than diesel or petrol. So we do need to simplify the message based on the science and based on the data. Uh, and, and I think that's the only way that we get it. In terms of policy incentives, I think uh, I would put my, uh, my vote for incentives on innovation because, again, to use the electric car, nobody these days wants to think as a customer about am I choosing this because it's green? They just want a better product, yeah? They want to you know, drive a Tesla because it's simply the best car in the world. It's not because it's green, um, but on all performance categories, it outperforms every other car. And I think that's come about because of innovation. So anything that policy can do to simply get the sustainable products to compete on quality and price, which are the two things we've seen are most important, without even having to mention the S word, I think will be what transforms it. Would you, um, so very interesting, uh, because, okay, so we have data information innovation. Of course, it's to simplify it. That's exactly what we try to do with the footprint. Uh, the one word, uh, or let's say some of those that didn't come out is regulations and bans. Um, and one of the questions, um, again, from the audience was, uh, well, how would you enforce the unfair trade practices? Because this is a law, and that law needs to have some stick, needs to really bite in order to make sure that everybody plays by the rules. Um, what would you say to, let's say, a, an idea, probably a crazy idea, that if we ever to come out uh, to, uh, with, uh, with uh, let's say, a good list of PEF um, rules or organizational environmental footprint rules, and we are sure that those are the ones, and we have as much consensus as we have right now on the limited number of these pilots, uh, what would you say that anything that is um, built not on those rules is simply forbidden? Let's say so that is, as not to mislead a consumer, that unless you've proven that you stick to those rules, you can't really say that anything that you do is green. What would you say to that? Would that be too drastic? Would that be sounding too Brussels, regulatory too intrusing into people's lives? Or would that be uh, something that I'm, I'm, I'm a great fan of, of strong regulation when it's appropriate and the right type. But I think the banning comes after the data, after you've done the studies and really proved the case. After the innovation that you've been able to show, there is a viable alternative that performs much better. And then if you look at the case of uh, light bulbs, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, we had compact fluorescence for a long time. And, and uh, if you look at Walmart and General Electric, they had a whole campaign to convert consumers. Still, they only got to a small proportion of consumers until you know, the, the, the EU said, right, we're banning incandescence because we'd got to the stage where it was absolutely clear this is the economically, socially, environmentally the better solution. I think the, the way to do it, though, is to make the ban based on performance, not on specific products. Yeah? So we want, for example, an emission level that is X. And, and if you can do that using your old 
product technology just adapted fine. And we've seen this a little bit with cars. The reason that electric vehicles are there are because of emission standards that came out in California that actually the Japanese car makers then innovated electrics in order to fulfill that. So there are still some combustion engines that are working hard to try and reduce, reduce, reduce. But as we start to say, well, actually what we need is zero carbon emissions, it's going to become pretty difficult for the combustion engine. And then those innovations will be the ones that really take over. So the right, you know, ban the based on performance, not based on product. Um, before I ask also Mr. Carson to, to reply to this, you know, one thing that comes to my mind, yes, indeed, what you said about incandescent bulbs was indeed one of the first stories, is that it, it was subject to a heavy regulation. And then we heard uh, the other stories coming back, and they said, well, you have really looked only at the energy part, at the consumption part. What about the end of life? What about the way you produce? What about anything else that's related to that? And probably it's true that if we calculated everything else again, I wouldn't be sure what the story would really tell us. But that, that, that's just to uh, depict the complexity of, of, of going into this, uh, into this direction. But what would you say about hard regulation? <clears throat> Hard regulate, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the point about energy efficiency because mm -hmm. there, if you look at the other aspects of the things that I mentioned, including detoxifying our economy, mm -hmm. um, there are certainly products that are highly toxic that do need to be banned um, because of the human health and environmental impacts that are so devastating, um, either acutely or, or chronically, that we need to address them. An example of this, um, thinking again about incandescent bulbs, is that. Uh, we recently concluded a global agreement called the Minamata Convention on Mercury. And there, in that convention, there's a phase out towards a elimination of many mercury-containing products. And why? Because their mercury is so highly toxic that it, they need to be eliminated over time. Not tomorrow, but with time, these things need to be eliminated. So when you take into account the detoxifying nature or the de detoxifying imperative of our economy, there are some for which that would happen. If you look at the, from the perspective of the environmental footprint um, and the totality of resources, minerals, water, energy, decarbonizing, all of these things, um, I think that we're in the best position now to use regula regulations as an incentive, as an enabler to push this agenda forward. Again, for the same reasons I mentioned about producers having the information, consumers having the information they need to make the correct choices. I believe if we do that, and we look at our own survey that we did here in the room earlier, and the numbers I presented that say 84% of European Union uh, citizens do want green products. It's just that 50% of those people don't believe necessarily that what they're seeing is real. If we provide the reliable information, people make the decisions, we will make the decisions, I believe, as a society to eliminate some of these materials without having to ban them. And to, again, um, to, to react to this, um, indeed, uh, toxicity is one of the parameters that is being judged in, uh, in this. And interestingly, um, you know, and here I'm speaking with, let's say, all due modesty, that as, as much as I can say, but European Union has, I would dare say, the most progressive and the far-reaching, something too far-reaching, regulation on chemicals and on substances. We have a, a regulation which uh, requires everyone to register every substance of certain size, uh, then evaluate it, test it, and, uh, and, and then uh, to give it up for the uh, public authorities to say what they do uh, with this, whether they want to restrict, ban, authorize, or to, to, to do something else with that. And you mentioned only mercury, yet we have now 17,000 substances that are being registered. Out of those, a good dozen are what we call substances of very high concern. The number probably will be increasing because there is not a single substance that has been exoner exonerated of its of its properties. In fact, the more we test, the more we know negative things about it, and the more we have to take care of those things. And all of that will definitely have to factor into the toxicity angles that we do, which then adds yet another layer of complexity from which we don't shine away, shy away, but we would be looking for any smart solutions from you how to handle that. What would you say about uh, uh, regulation? First, yeah, regulation, yeah. I'm, I'm not really a fan, no. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And 
the, the, the reason for that is uh, I'm a little bit concerned that it would create, again, a lot of administration and a lot of um, effort that is not going to bring uh, any improvement in the ecological footprint in this situation. Um, I do believe that it is uh, at some point in time necessary, I agree, but I think it's way too early to think about it right now. I think there's still a lot we can do on a, a voluntary base or, or an incentivized base. Um, I do believe that if we could bring some um, large partners, producers together, uh, there is really uh, a lot of information and data already available that we can uh, set up something that we can already start using and then try to experience and see what we can learn from that before we start applying or um, creating more rules because I'm a little bit concerned as a big company will manage but for the, the medium sized and the smaller companies it's going to be a huge challenge. Um, because, and that's something, again, we haven't talked about yet, but we're talking here about the environmental aspects. But for a customer, if you look at our products, uh, that's why we have four logos. Uh, health is another very important thing. A uh, customer wants to know what is in the product from a health perspective. Animal welfare, it's another uh, thing that is very important for the people living in, in Belgium. The last couple of months has been really high on the, on the radar. Um, and then there are the social aspects. So you, we have to find a way that we can bring all of this together. And I don't think right now the way is by uh, more rules. Well, why, what would I expect else from, uh, from business? But I think what you say is, 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 has a deeper meaning into that, is that we really have to see what other, other uh, ways before we really take the pen and, and start writing the hard, um, hard regulations. Now, what I would like to do for the remaining of the time is to open up um, uh, uh, the audience, uh, a possibility to also comment um, ask questions, agree, disagree, offer your own solutions. You've done that on the, on the Slido platform, but I'm sure that there are many other thoughts that are on your mind that have been overlooked or, and could not have been taken up, but uh, well, here is a chance for you to say something, and um, I think I have microphones going around, so if anybody would like to say something, please, here is a chance. Okay, here is a gentleman on the third row. Um, <clears throat> technology could solve the automatic flow of uh, comprehensive materials uh, flowing through the economy. Um, do you think there's a demand for that to put uh, a complete environmental picture, a complete environmental picture? in consumers' hands. Do you? Anybody wants to answer this tricky question? We've seen some experiments with this already. Yeah. So uh, already we're empowering customers with apps that can scan using a barcode the products. If you look at uh, uh, something like Good Guide, there's about 120,000 products that are on that that are rated on environment, health, and, and community. Um, it comes back to whether, um, whether they trust that, uh, that data-driven uh, process, because indeed we can do it technically, I think, but what's behind it and does it have trust? It also comes to what we haven't really talked about, which is the the psychology of this whole th thing of ethical consumption, because we all say that we want to consume and that we will consume ethically, but we know that in practice it's between one, and if you're lucky, in some product categories, 10% that will actually buy ethical. Um, and uh, they did an experiment in Australia, for example, on fair trade coffee, which they interviewed everybody afterwards and said, yes, they love the concept, they definitely support fair trade coffee, but when they actually put the sign in the window and said fair trade coffee, no extra charge, just ask, only 1% went for it. When they changed the experiment to say fair trade coffee, would you like some, madam or sir, it went up to 30%, so when you get prompted, it's different. 
And when they changed it again to ask the same question when somebody was standing next to the customer, it went up to 70%. Yeah, so we have to, so in that sense, technology doesn't just solve the problem. I think we can, the more information we can give customers, the better, but does it make it simpler for them? You know, do they really believe that the quality and the price is, is comparable? Because until you get that right, they won't make that choice. I, I do believe that there are two levels also in interaction. I think as a customer, if you go to a store, you want to have a very uh, swift tool to make a decision, be it a logo or something else. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes people want to go a little bit deeper and want to have more information, then it should be available. But I think if we really want to help customers while they're buying their products, we should have something that is very easy to evaluate, not too complex, not too many uh, yeah, traffic lights, for instance, yeah, uh, should be easy. Yeah, so the KISS principle, huh? the well-known one. Anybody else? Yes, the gentleman on, yes, in the white shirt. Yeah, I have to stand up. <laughs> My name is Paul Brown from uh, Heineken. I was uh, part of the beer PEF pilot. And um, to comment a bit on the KISS principle and consumer information, I think for, for companies like ours and other brewers, other big companies, we are basically in the same boat at the start of the path. We are also confused. And in fact, to drive for simplicity as such does not help. We really need to understand our sustainability agenda so we can set the right targets and do the right things. And in that sense, the, uh, the whole path Pilots, although time-consuming, was, I think, a good investment for us. And I say us for the brewers of Europe, but also on behalf of the beverage industry and Environmental Roundtable. And um, we think that in the business-to-business -business domain, there is really a big opportunity with the PEF. We see it basically as a building block. It is justifying the calculations for science-based target setting. And we need to do a lot more on proper monitoring to, to set targets in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. There's some urgency there. So basically, we use the PEF as a building block for our circular economy agenda and for our business response. And in that sense, I uh, really appreciate also the drive for more transparency and primary data. And um, yeah, I want to give a big thanks to Michaela and his team because it was a lot of work and we are still not there, but we are definitely eager to, to make this work in practice. And so I just wanted to comment a bit on uh, simplicity. We can simplify later and maybe in the consumer domain, but for business to business, we need to understand where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Well, since it was more of a comment, I'd like then to give another opportunity to the audience and then we'll come back to the panel. So is there anybody else? I see a lady on, I think, seventh row, right in the middle of, yeah, yeah right here. Oh yeah, okay, oh, it's coming. Hi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to, my name is Susan Stubing. I'm from a consulting company, Origami, from the Netherlands. I'd like to ask Mr. Corbett a question. Um, I just tried to check it in my notes, if I heard it correctly, but I think you showed on one of your slides that you said business comes second. And that's very interesting. I recently saw one of our, no our um, Olympic gold medalists said that he won the Olympic gold medal, Svan de Vida, a swimmer, because he thought he would win the silver. So he came in first because he thought he was going to come second. So my question is, um, what is your business and uh, what comes first? So it's a, it's a great um, statement you made. And I hope you did make it. So. OK, well, yes, well, apparently here is an advice to go for silver in the first place <laughs> if you want to get gold. But yeah, yeah please, what's that secret? Right, this too, and I think a very big secret, as I can say, but it's staying here. Uh, I'm really lucky that we are a family-owned company because it helps a lot. We don't have to think only at the short term, we can think at the long term. And because of that, we always say that we are goal-oriented and not result-oriented. Results comes when, once we achieve the goals. But we try to think ahead. We don't think only at the short term, not one year ahead, three year, 
five years, ten years sometimes. And we try really to determine uh, the goals there. That's why we also, and Jeff explained it, uh, look a lot at the trends that are occurring in the short and longer term. Because that way we can anticipate on what is uh, going on. Thank you. I would probably give yet one more shot to the audience. If there is any burning comment, question here. Yeah, well, if not, then I would like to maybe ask Michele to say if he has spotted any super interesting question, something that got overlooked in this discussion. And well, by the way, also passing over to that conflict uh, co compliment uh, to you. I, I can fully share also as, as, as a colleague uh, of Michele that this is really a treasure team that he has been leading. And that's why I really hope that the result would be that outstanding. But is there anything else? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I am blushing. Um, there was one interesting question that I would like to ask to our panel. Um, PEF is a lot about product comparisons. What about companies' comparisons? Also in view of the sustainable finance action, the non-financial reporting, do you think that is the next step? And what do we need to make available in order to get to the point where we can compare also companies and not only products? I, I'd like all three of you to try to answer that question. In fact, I think it's the other way around. I, I think that we've had um, 30 years of company comparisons with mixed methodologies to be sure, but you, you know, the world is awash with, with rankings of companies, with ways that we, we try to compare them. And we're talking again mainly about the big brands. And I'm not sure how effective that's been at all. Um, I remember being told by the head of sustainability for a multinational pharmaceutical company, he, he's the head of sustainability in China, that in the same week he got a best environmental reporting or sustainability reporting award and a, a spoof award for the fourth most toxic company in the world. Yeah, so it becomes really uh, difficult for, for the company comparisons. And I think what happens in practice is that as consumers and as the public, we relate to brands, and a lot of brands are product-related, and the real impacts are product-related. Um, and that if something goes wrong with a product, then we might link it back to the brand, back to a Nike or to a another big brand and then we punish them or we reward them accordingly. But the problem at the moment with the company comparisons is that, you know, the one comparison list is contradicting the other list. Also that the lists that we have are almost always the same usual suspects, the, the top companies, the top 100 companies in any given context. It doesn't go deeper than that and I'm not sure there's a real incentive People are not that interested in the small and medium-sized companies and, and being able to compare them. So for me, the, the evolution is actually to the product level because that's where the impact is, that's where the purchasing decisions are, that's where the information gap is. Uh, and I think that's the powerful step that we're taking with the footprint. Um, maybe in B2B, it's going to be very useful to have that organizational footprint but from, from a consumer perspective, I'm not so convinced. Mr. Kastan, maybe? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like to say that, yes, I do think organizational uh, environmental footprint is, a, is, is an appropriate uh, way to follow. And I'm going to take a different angle is that looking at organizations that don't make products um, and looking at government, looking at national government, looking at cities, looking at intergovernmental organizations such as my own, is what is our footprint in the way in which we do our business. And I do think that this is an increasingly important area because if I'm the mayor of a city, I would like to know the sustainability or the footprint that my city carries. And in the UN, we also have a program called the Sustainable UN, which not surprisingly is, is facilitated by the UN Environment Program, but where we do go out and work with other UN agencies to see what their footprint is. 
So we're measuring uh, energy efficiency, we're measuring waste, we're looking at all kinds of things across the organization, including, for example, peacekeeping operations, which one might think, oh, well, uh, for peacekeeping, we have to do things the most uh, rapid way possible, get things done, make sure people are safe, but there are also ways in which we can make those more sustainable and to reduce the environmental footprint of those organizations as well. Since we're in Belgium, uh, we like consensus, so I'd like to, uh, <laughs> to, to mediate. I, I think both of them are important. Um, if I look at our own example, that's the only one I, 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 I know, of course. Uh, we have used the uh, organizational environmental footprint um, mainly for our own benefit and to determine the spots where we can improve ourselves. Not to compare ourselves with our competitors. Anyhow, it's very difficult to compare because uh, every company is, is quite a lot different. If you look at our group, for instance, we have energy production, we have uh, retail activities, we have production activities, so it, it is difficult to compare anyhow. But we have useful information um, of the analysis that we can use to improve ourselves. And then, of course, there is a product, uh, the PEF. We talked about it before. It is very important. It will give us the hotspots where we can make improvements and will give us a lot of information that um, that customers uh, can use. So I think we need both. Well, um, I could probably add uh, from my own angle here um, is, uh, uh, and to say that um, as a public institution, European Commission also follows certain um, uh, obligations. We have um, uh, been part of the called Echo Management and Audit Scheme, EMAS, uh, something that I would really like to um, uh, also uh, promote and advertise among uh, your organizations. Uh, this is a scheme that doesn't necessarily have a sexy name, but that's the one thanks to which we have also made uh, incredible savings on, for instance, water, energy, uh, electricity, um, uh, heating, uh, the paper supplies. Overall, over the uh, last 10 years, Thanks to this, and there was an extra effort, we have saved 100 million euros, and that is taxpayers' money. 100 million euro is not a trivial sum that we feel, and we're sure that um, we can do a lot more, but then businesses can also do a lot more. So the question is how we can link up to this, for instance, organizational environmental footprint, and to bring in all these practices and ideas uh, there, and to link them up. Now, um, since... Um, we are, we are at the end, and uh, the one resource uh, that we don't measure in the footprint, but is never recyclable, is never renewable, is time. I would like to uh, save it for yourselves. I'd like to save it also for, uh, for the cocktail, as well as live music, which you deserve, um, I'm sure, and which will then lead into the next two days of very rich discussions. Rich discussions, um, uh, it is guaranteed because this is a very complex thing that we are talking about. And the one um, quote from the history that comes to my mind was that when Leonardo da Vinci was spending his last um, years um, somewhere in France, uh, and when he was asked by disciples what is really the secret of everything, uh, of his wisdom, he said, well, look closer and you will see that everything is connected to everything else. That's a trivial conclusion, but I think this really applies to, um, uh, to the footprint. And yet, uh, if we want to uh, uh, come out with a genius proposal, it has to um, uh, be linked the way the Da Vinci has described his own wisdom. Well, with this, I'd like to um, um, ask audience to thank our wonderful panel. Give them a hand. I'd like to also thank you for being active in your poll. Uh, the um, participation rate is uh, commendable. So thank you very much for, for doing this. Uh, there is civil society out there in the audience. So please uh, use that slider tool tomorrow and day after tomorrow because it gives us each other a pretty good picture of what we think. And, uh, well, enjoy the rest of the day, and I'll be seeing you tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Thank you very much.